Hello, my name is uh, Philip Spencer from Audio Technology Magazine. Welcome to our first uh, webinar. Um, from the 1st of January 2015, frequencies between 694 and 820 will no longer be available for wireless microphones and in-ear monitors. Uh, luckily today we have James Waldron, who's the wireless product specialist from Sennheiser Microphones, to join us to tell us more about it and more importantly what we can do about it. Thank you. Yes, very well, James, and I'm going to leave this in your capable hands. Okay. Um, thanks, Phil. Um, it's nice to be here with everybody. I hope you uh, enjoy the time that you spend with us now that we have um, some audio happening. It's a good thing. Hey, look, um, there's a few things we want to cover off today. As Philip mentioned, the digital dividend is... Uh, is an important thing. It really is very close to uh, the end of that process now, so we're going to cover off uh, that and bring you up to date with the latest news and um, some resources to help you get through it. And then we also want to cover off a few RF tips and tricks. So a few of the different things that um, can help make your life a little bit easier in wireless land, the sort of things that bite us when we're not paying attention. Cool. So let's have a quick look at what's going on in digital dividend land. Why is there a digital dividend? Why do we need this? Well, the fact is that lots and lots of people, all of us really, have a smart device of some sort. And we're using lots and lots more mobile data. Cisco does some, uh, some research on this every year and they're forecasting about 78% annual growth rate of mobile data. So that's lots and lots more mobile data that needs to be floating around to uh, give us all everything that we want from our mobile devices. Around the world, it's been decided that um, part of the spectrum that was used for analog television will be reserved for use by mobile data. So for that reason, we have to clear out, in Australia, we have to clear out of what's called the 700 megahertz band. This is because, basically, lots and lots of mobile data going on these days. It seems that this process has been going on forever, really, doesn't it? Um, I've been talking about it, as have a number of other people in the industry, for a long time. Um, but it really is a minute to midnight. January 1, 2015 is really the time that this is all going to kick off. There are two major things going on here that we need to be aware of. Number one, the telcos are moving into part of the spectrum that we're all used to using for our wireless devices. Number two, the TV stations have all changed their frequencies all around the country. And so we need to be careful that we're not operating on the same frequencies as they are, because really, um, for wireless mics, they'll swamp us if we try to operate on the same frequencies as them. Um, there's also a legal issue there. We're not allowed to. So there we go. So let's have a quick look just at where we have been operating. Over a number of years, there's three little pieces of spectrum that have been available to us. Typically, we've been operating in the UHF area. That's the red one that's labelled here. There are two other little spectrum pieces, one around 900 megahertz and one around 1800 megahertz that are also available for us to use for our wireless microphones. But the main one that we're focused on today is this area. Traditionally, we've been between 520 and 820 megahertz. We're a secondary user. The primary user of this frequency band are the television stations. They pay lots of money for their licenses to use this spectrum, so they are the primary user. We operate under a what's called a low interference potential devices class license, which uh, we don't pay anything for. Consequently, we have no protection from interference and we have to operate on the basis that we don't interfere with anybody who pays a license fee. So there's still lots of spectrum and lots of space for us to operate in, but we are there on a no protection, no interference basis. So that's where we are. That's the current um, operating system till the end of the year. The digital dividend, as I said, has been coming for a long time, since um, about 2009 or 8, I think, they started talking about it. There's been really four, st four stages, count them, um, to uh, this coming along. The first one, remember back in the dark ages, there was uh, only analogue television, and the frequencies, the different channels were spread about, just sort of scattered, not quite randomly, but there was lots of space in between them for us to use. In 2010, we saw the introduction of digital television, and it was during that time that the digital stations were set up in between all the analog ones. So our spectrum got a little bit um, tighter. It wasn't as easy to find a channel as it had been before. 
In 2013, there was a process to turn all the analog stations off. So that happened throughout 2013. Our life got a little bit easier. And then this year, through 2014, the digital television stations have all changed frequency. The, so that process called the restack has happened. The last of it happened, I believe, on Thursday last week in Canberra and Gunning. Um, so the digital TV restack is essentially finished now and the TV stations will stay where they are for, uh, for quite a long time in the future. On this little slide here, you can see that the um, the red area here between 694 and 820 megahertz is the area that we've all had to move out of. Okay, so this is the area that has been reserved for the telcos to operate in. So us and the TV stations have had to move out of there down into this little part from 694 down to 520 megahertz. So that's the process that's been going on this year. The TV stations have all done it, hopefully, most of uh, our wireless mic users have also um, managed to, uh, to move frequencies. So that's the current situation. You need to remember it's illegal from January 1 to transmit in that range from 694 to 820. Um, and if you happen to be on the, uh, the telco's frequencies, it'll probably be fairly difficult for you to operate successfully as well. Okay, so what are the telcos doing in that digital dividend spectrum? Let's have a look at uh, a little slide here that shows you the spectrum and what the uses are inside the digital dividend. So this graph here shows you, well, where's my mouse, there he is. So this shows you the spectrum from 694 up to 820 megahertz. Okay, up the top here, here we go. Um, and what's happening with it? The two yellow blocks are where the telcos will be operating. The top block here from 758 up to, um, whatever that is, plus 45. I'm sorry, my maths is uh, not that flash, but they've got 45 megs here for the downlink. So that's from the tower down to your mobile device. And uh, the other block that you can see here is another 45 megahertz available here. This is for the uplink. So that's from your mobile device up to the tower. So there are two blocks of channels there. In the middle is a mid-band gap because certainly at the towers, as Offspring said, you've got to keep them separated. And there are some little guard bands at each end as well, at the low frequency end to keep the television stations separate from the mobile data, and at the top end to keep the, the uh, mobile data away from whatever else is happening up above it. So that's what's going on. Let's have a look at what happened in the auction for the telcos that happened in uh, 2013. There were two telcos successful. One of those was Optus. Optus were successful with their bid for two blocks of 10 megahertz. So they have 10 megahertz for the uplink, and those frequencies are 703 to 713 megahertz, 703 to 713, and they have 10 megs obviously complementary for the downlink, and that is 758 to 768 megs. So those are the frequencies that Optus have. Telstra also bid, and they won 20 megahertz, two blocks of 20 megahertz. So they've got um, 20 megahertz in the uplink from 713 to 733, so they're right next to the Optus frequencies. And in the uh, other spectrum, in, uh, in the downlink, they have 768 to 788 megahertz. So those are the two telcos who have some spectrum that they, um, that they were successful in bidding for in the auction in 2013. The interesting thing is that 10 megahertz for Optus and 20 megahertz from Telstra makes 30 and there's 45 available, so there's still 15 megs that is not sold yet. Um, I guess it won't be sold until there's some real value for the government. Um, they're not gonna sell it for nothing, they'll wait until um, the market is really pushing to generate the best value that they can for that, um, which um, I'm keen for them to do as a taxpayer. Okay, um, the deadline of course was, or that we all talk about, is 1 January 2015, but Optus and Telstra were successful in negotiating with ACMA to gain early access um, to be able to do some trials and um, to see how their systems are going to operate in the real world. So those trials are underway um, in many places around Australia as we speak. Telstra are running trials right now. They have all of the mainland capital cities, uh, Perth, Sydney, Melbourne, Radelaide, Darwin and Brisbane are all on the air in the CBD with Telstra right now. 
In fact, in Sydney, they uh, switched on on the day the iPhone 6 was launched. So um, what a coincidence. Anyway, all of these sites um, and a number of regional ones too for Telstra are switched on right now. They're on all day, every day, and they won't be switching off. So be aware that those frequencies, 713 to 733 and 768 to 788, are on the air right now in lots and lots of places around the country. If you want to know some more about where Telstra are transmitting, you can uh, go to their website, telstra.com.au slash consumer advice. Um, you'll need to contact them because there's not a whole lot of information on the website. Um, but there is an email address and a phone number for them and um, they'll be happy to tell you what they're doing right now. I'm not sure they'll tell you what they're going to do in the future, but um, they can certainly tell you what they're doing right now. Optus are on the air as well in a number of places. So you might think, ah, oh, there's only, um, only three cities where Optus are on the air. Not quite true. They've only got three um, of their commercial trials that um, they're calling at the moment, Perth, Port Augusta and Darwin. Um, so on the air, 703 to 713 and 758 to 768. But Optus have lots and lots and lots of other technical testing sites which are on the air as well. So their sites now include a number of regional areas around New South Wales, the Territory, Queensland, South Australia, Victoria and WA. Um, there's a good list of them on the, the Optus website, but all of those sites, lots and lots of regional sites around Australia are on the air with Telstra right now. Uh, sorry, with Optus right now. If you want to find out some more about what's going on with Optus and their trials in 700 megahertz, you can go to their website optus.com.au slash 700 tech trial, or one word. Um, the info on the website may or may not be right up to date. Optus have been pretty good at keeping everybody up to date, but um, if you want to make really sure of what's going on at your place, you can email them, trial at optus.com.au, or the phone number there, 1300 720086. They'll be happy to help you out with information about what's going on there. So be aware. Those two telcos are on the air in lots and lots of places around the country. So that's one part of the digital dividend story. The other part is that the TV stations have all changed their frequencies as well. And they've taken a rather different approach to what it was before. Previously, the TV stations were scattered all over the place and there were little bits of clear spectrum for us to jump onto wherever we were. They've changed their approach now. Their approach now is that the TV stations in any one market are all in blocks of frequencies. So that means the six TV channels that are allocated, so ABC, SBS, the three commercial networks, and one more that's uh, unallocated at the moment. So the planning is for six TV channels in any market. Each one is seven megahertz wide, so six times seven makes a 42 megahertz block. So you can see on the chart here that there are four of these blocks that cover the frequency range from 526 to 694. So depending where you are in the country, your digital television will be on one of these blocks. Okay, so wherever this block is, you won't be able to use your wireless mics. The one thing I should say is that the big major television uh, markets, which are the capital cities, um, the the television is on VHF, down around 200 megahertz, doesn't really bother us. But there are lots and lots of infill stations to fill in little gaps and shadows and all those kinds of things in the cities. So quite often the cities are just as challenging to get your wireless mics working in. So I guess the question is, well, how do I know what frequency bank is being used where I am? Good question, because that really is the crux of it, right? So there's a few resources on the web that can help you find those. I'm just going to put up a slide now that will show you the addresses for some of those resources and then we'll have a quick look at them on the web so you can sort of be familiar with what they look like. So ddready.com.au is a site that tells the story of the digital dividend and what you can do to, um, to sort out your wireless mics around the digital dividend. Frequencyfinder.com is a really useful website because it'll tell you what frequencies are in use in uh, any location in Australia for digital television and suggest frequencies for you to use with your wireless systems. 
My switch is a government website and that actually shows you the transmission pattern for, uh, for the television transmission in any particular area. ACMA have also put together a channel finder. It's really useful as well. It has uh, quite a lot of um, science and technology behind it, so it's, um, it's pretty good. And then, of course, there's the two uh, telco sites, Optus and Telstra, that we talked about before. Let's have a look just quickly to familiarise ourselves with what those websites look like. So the first one here, actually what I'm going to do is just show you the websites for the, uh, to help you with the resources for Frequency Finder, okay, for finding channels. So the first of these um, resources here, my goodness, it's looking a little large on the screen, isn't it? Is that going to fit properly? Let's just do this, put this back here, there we go. So at myswitch.digitalready.gov.au, it shows you the transmission pattern for any television transmitter around the place. So I put in Morty Alloc in Victoria, a lovely beachside suburb, and you can see there's a number of transmitters available for Morty Alloc. The green one is Melbourne, the main VHF transmitter, and it provides coverage everywhere. So if you click on that, it'll very quickly show you that you have transmission coverage really solidly. Green means good, so you've got lots from Melbourne. But if you go to somewhere like Upway, which um, here is um, up in the hills, you'll see that you get some patchy coverage down around Morty Alloc. If you go to Melbourne inner suburbs, it'll show you where the inner suburbs transmitter goes, and you'll see basically it's from the CBD north, a little bit down south, so marginal coverage. The MySwitch website is really good at showing you all this kind of information. The other one I want to show you is the frequencyfinder.com.au. So you can put in any location, this one, by the way, works on any device. So it'll work on your phone, it'll work on your, on your smartphone, it'll work on your, uh, your tablet device, it'll work on your laptop computer, it'll work in your office, on your desktop computer, anywhere where you have network access, you can get to uh, Frequency Finder and it'll resize for you, look really snappy on screen. So again, I put in Morty Alec here, and this is telling me the frequencies that uh, are available for us to use for wireless microphones, and because it's Sennheiser who've put this together, it also shows you how they match up with the different wireless mic systems. Um, but the real core of the information is, in case you're not using a Sennheiser, um, the TV channel number and the frequencies, and whether you are good to go or not good to go. Okay? So, it's um, a very helpful resource for you as well. Uh, my switch, the uh, ACMA website, the channel finder here. Again, you can put in a, uh, a location anywhere in Australia and um, have a quick look here. It'll show you where Morty Alec is on a map. Well, I'm guessing you can zoom out so that people who don't know where that is can see where that is. It's on the bay side there in Melbourne. And it will do calculations for you and show you which frequencies. So the VHF one's obviously not available. But in UHF land, you'll see there's some in the low frequency there that are available. You'll see there's some in the middle area of the UHF where it's saying uh, you'll probably be okay indoors. And there's some at the top end of the band here where it's saying, yeah, you'll be fine. So this is a really useful resource for you too. So there we have it. The, um, the resources, the digital dividend and where to go to find information to help you deal with the digital dividend. So hopefully that's been useful for you. Um, please feel free to bang in some questions and we'll answer some questions for you uh, in a little while at the end of the next little section of our fun together today. Okay, um, and if you're looking at this and um, from a recording, always give us a call. We'll be happy to help you out with any questions you've got. Okay, I'll take a deep breath and we'll head on towards RF tips and tricks. So let's have a look at a couple of the things, the most common things that bite us in wireless land when we're not looking. Just as well, technology's come a long way since uh, we introduced our first wireless microphone system back in 1957. And um, looking at the pictures, I'd have to say it's not only the technology that's come a long way as well. I think our advertising has um, made some changes as well. It's, um, Sign of the times, I think, 1957, wow. So, let's have a look at a couple of topics. Three main ones here, antennas, cables and boosters is uh, sort of lumped together there, that's, that's one area. Intermodulation is something that um, quite often bites us significantly. And um, then we're gonna have a look at 
how to do frequency selection. What frequencies should we actually use? And uh, to do that little section, I'm going to need the other handheld mic that Philip's walked away with earlier. So um, at some stage, I'm sure Philip will come and um, show me that microphone again. So let's move on, shall we? Antennas and cables. Oh, thank you. Haven't sold it yet. Philip, what are you doing? OK, antennas and cables. This is um, a subject dear to my heart. Your antennas on your wireless mic system are your system's ears, okay? It's really important. If you're monitoring in a studio or listening um, to mix a band, you're not going to do it with a pillow over your head or your fingers in your ears or something. So please don't do that to your wireless mic system. Get your antennas out in the open air where they can hear what's going on properly. Really, really important. It makes a big difference to how well your wireless system works. As an example of what not to do, Here's a really snappy looking AV installation in a corporate environment. Looks pretty nice. It's awesome. From my point of view, the mistake here is that the antennas are inside the rack. The rack's probably built of steel, and as we all know, steel is a really good shield for RF energy. So for wireless energy, steel is a really good shield. That's why we put the receivers in a steel case, to shield them from external inter interference. Steel works really well as a shield. And there's two issues going on here. The other part of this is that not only are the antennas shielded from your transmitter, so you've easily lost 10 dB of signal just right there, inside the rack here, and this one's particularly bad because those two little sticks are probably detuned a long way by the uh, device below it, but inside the rack here, there's all these other wiring issues going on. There's Ethernet and there'll be DVI. I don't think, I think this slide's so old, there's probably not DVI. But um, there'll be DVI and HDMI and all manner of digital signals in here that'll radiate, those cables will radiate, and inside here is a veritable stew of interference for your wireless system to cope with. So there's a really, really easy way to help your wireless system give its very best performance. And that is to get your antennas out of that rack. Even if you just get them on the front of the rack, it's a really, really good start. A really, really good start because you've got 10 dB of improvement because they're no longer hiding in that shield and you've got another 10 dB improvement because the interference that's living inside that steel rack is now attenuated by at least 10 dB by the steel rack itself. So realistically, you've just won yourself 20 dB better performance out of your wireless system by putting your antennas outside the rack really, really important thing to do. And it tricks lots of people. You can't just assume that you can stick the antennas in the back and it'll be just wonderful, because it's really, you're not giving the system a fighting chance of operating well. Okay, apart from using the little stick antennas on the front, there are also much better ways of doing it. And uh, some of the specialist antennas give you some real advantages as well. So, in terms of external antennas, there's a couple of types that are probably most commonly available for you. There's an omnidirectional paddle. Here's one I prepared earlier. Looks like this, okay? And it picks up all around, omni, everything, everywhere, okay? It picks up all around. So you can mount this anywhere you like um, in a good location to pick up your radio signals, okay? It works much better than the little stick antenna, let me tell you, much better. So mount that. If you're in a corporate environment, you won't want to put it up in the ceiling space as long as it's not crowded out by all the machinery in there. If you're on stage, get it out somewhere in the open air. Don't hide it up in a lighting truss or something or gaffer tape it onto a truss. Get it out in the open air, keep some space around it. It'll do a really good job for you. So that's an omnidirectional antenna, picks up from every direction in the same way. The other one that's on the slide here is a directional antenna. That's like this guy, okay? For us, we call it a 2003, A2003. It's a directional antenna, okay? So, and uh, as you might expect, it's directional that way, yep. But it's not, um, it's not directional like a laser pointer. It's um, a little more broad than that. So let's just step forward a couple of slides here to, um, show you how this little puppy works. 
come on computer, you can do it. There we go. So this antenna, the directional antenna, has a pickup pattern like a supercardioid mic. Okay, so it is certainly, it has some gain out the front, as we can see, oh, sorry, as we can see on the, uh, on the little diagram here, it has some gain out the front, um, somewhere between four and six dB. So it's, um, it uh, has some gain out the front in a conical sort of pattern, okay? So it's conical gain out the front, somewhere between four and six dB. Like your supercardioid mic too, it has a little lobe out the back. So it'll also pick up signals from the back. That's about 10 dB down. So between the front and the back, you have about 15 dB difference, but you will still get some pickup from the back. The really important thing about this, just like a supercardioid mic, is that these paddles have a real null on the sides. So that means that there's uh, about a 20 dB null point on the sides. So this is a really useful tool. Apart from being directional forwards with some gain, you can really use that null point to help minimise interference. So if you know where your interference is coming from or if you can figure out where you're getting uh, an interference signal from, and again, your directional antenna is really helpful at, um, at finding that, then um, you can choose to point that null point towards your interference, and that's a really, really useful tool. Okay. I'm going to ask you to bang in some questions about uh, antennas if you have some, and uh, we can uh, answer some of those later on. Next little point I wanted to cover is antenna cables. Um, one of the uh, senior engineers at Sennheiser who works, um, has worked on uh, wireless mics for many, many years, Klaus Willemsen, um, his opinion is that the biggest problem with wireless mics is the wires. Um, because people forget about them. They think everything's wireless and it's just like you know, a little piece of string. It's not. It, uh, it has much more influence on your system performance than you might think. The biggest thing about antenna cables is that they have some attenuation. So down the cable, you lose some of the signal that your antenna picks up. And so you need to be able to understand how much that attenuation is and is it an issue for you that you need to deal with or need to overcome. So there's a few different types of cables that get um, used for this pretty typically. The most common one, of course, is the ubiquitous RG58. Here's a, uh, here's a little RG58 cable. So it's the standard skinny stuff. Can you see it? Yeah, I can't see it against me, but yeah. So there's one. I'll put it over here. So yeah, standard flexible cable. The stuff that we all know and love sometimes and hate at other times. So it's cheap, it's ubiquitous, it's flexible. You can buy it everywhere, RG58. But the, the, uh, the quality of RG58, if we can just go back to the slide for a minute, please, is that over 100 metres of RG58, which I'm not going to recommend you use, you lose about 50 dB of that signal, which is way too much for the system to deal with. So 50 dB over 100 metres, that means you lose 5 dB every 10 metres. So it's a linear sort of progression. So 50 dB over 100 metres means significant attenuation. So even at, uh, say, a 15 or 20 minute, 15 or 20 metre cable, you've got something of the order of 7.5 to 12 or 13 dB of loss. And that's the kind of scale that you need to make up. You can't really deal with 10 dB of loss. If you want to um, run longer cables and deal with less loss, you can go to something like RG213 or RG8. These are um, somewhat heavier cables, somewhat thicker cables. You can see, um, yeah, this is um, a serious piece of cable. It's about um, nearly a centimetre thick. It weighs a bit more, it's a bit stiffer, it's a bit more uh, difficult to deal with than RG58, but it's half the attenuation. So, in theory, you can run twice the length for the same attenuation as you would get with RG58. So RG213 is a great cable if you've got, um, if you've got longer runs and you need to uh, minimise your losses, RG213 is a good cable to be using at about 25 dB per 100 metres attenuation. LMR400 is another cable that uh, gets used quite often for longer runs because its attenuation is roughly 11 or 12 dB per 100 metres. So you can run long lengths of LMR400, for example, with um, not very much attenuation at all. Of course, you pay for 
lower attenuation in the cable with bigger size and more cost or less flexibility. All those things come into the package. I wouldn't want to say that RG58 is, uh, is not a good cable. All that's important to remember is that all of these cables have certain specifications and if you want your system to run properly, you need to be aware of them and take them into account when, you have, when you're doing your system planning. Okay? Um, you can run RG58 if you want, just make sure you've got the relevant boosters and that the system's engineered properly. Really, really important. The other point I want to make is about the impedance of the cables. All the wireless systems are designed for 50 ohms, not just ours. All the wireless systems around are designed for 50 ohm antenna systems. The antennas are 50 ohms, the receivers are 50 ohms. Use 50 ohm coax, please. Um, 75 ohm coax is a video cable. It's around, it's cheap, and you can plug it on and it probably works. It's not exactly the same performance as the 50 ohm cable, so it probably works. One of the issues that's not quite so apparent is that a 75 ohm BNC connector is slightly different dimensions to a 50 ohm. In particular, the center pin's a bit bigger. So if you plug in that 75 ohm BNC into your 50 ohm socket a few times, and then you plug in a 50 ohm connector, guess what? The little spigots where that pin's been fitting into are now too wide to reliably connect to your 50 ohm connector. So please, from an engineering point of view, 50 ohms is the go. Cool. The other thing that I mentioned is you need to be able to take account of your attenuation down the cable and do something about it. That means using a booster. And there's a really important rule, two really important rules actually, when you're using boosters. The first rule is to put the booster close to the antenna, okay? So boost the signal where it's strongest and cleanest. Then down your antenna cable and any subsequent uh, passive splitting or combining, you will get your attenuation and you will probably have some noise added there, probably not that much, but some noise will get introduced into that signal. And over the run of the cable and any sort of passive splitter or whatever, the attenuation will attenuate not only your boosted signal here, but it also attenuates the noise back down. So that's a really important thing to do, okay? You don't want to be um, boosting the noise if you can possibly help it. So boost at the antenna and let the, um, the cable attenuation take care of the rest of it. And it's really, really important that you boost only to make up for what you lose in attenuation. Don't just think, oh, I'll just wind the boost up flat out because that's really good. It's not. What you'll end up doing, or what you can end up doing, is overloading the front end of your receiver, and you know, then you'll find it really hard to find any frequencies to use at all. So only boost to make up what you lose down the cable. Really important rule. Okay, number three, um, any questions? Bag them in, and we'll come to them soon. Number three, intermodulation. Are we there? There we are. Okay, intermodulation. This is, um, sounds like a bit of a techie word really, doesn't it? But it's a reasonably straightforward concept to come to terms with. And intermodulation happens when you have two transmitters that are reasonably close together, physically reasonably close together. So as an example, let's take a look at, say, a couple of handheld transmitters. Intermodulation happens when the output signal from one, so it's in the air, gets picked up at the antenna of the other one. So I've got one mic here, it's transmitting, uh, how can I show that, like this, okay, it's transmitting, signal's radiating out of the antenna, all good. And then I have another mic here, okay, so maybe I've got the uh, lead vocalist, a backup singer or something like this. Each of these transmitting antennas is also a receiving antenna, and so it can pick up the signal from the other transmitter, that signal gets into the output stage of the transmitters, upsets them, they stop working in a linear fashion and generate harmonics. That's how intermods are generated. The harmonics inside each transmitter then get retransmitted into the air and generate new signals in the air, which now you can't use those extra frequencies for your wireless mics because those signals are occupied by the intermodulation products from these two transmitters. So, the maths with two transmitters is really easy. Let's go back to the slide and have a quick look at how that works. 
So you can see here I've got, um, as an example, two microphones, one on 581 megahertz, let's call that F1, it's the blue guy. Um, where's my little, oh, the mouse is a bit slow here. So it's the blue guy, let's say he's operating on 581 megahertz, and the other mic is on 582 megahertz, the green one here. So I've got two mics operating on those frequencies. So the RF signal that each transmits gets into the other transmitter, it generates some harmonics, and intermodulation products are transmitted into the air. The maths is pretty simple, and it is maths. I'm afraid this is basically the laws of physics that put you by the short and curlies. Um, so what will happen is that one of the mics will generate intermodulation products at twice its own frequency, less the frequency of the other one. So in this case, it's uh, two times 581 minus 582. In this case, that makes 580 megahertz. The other one will generate intermodulation products at twice its own, right? Twice the own, so twice 582 minus the other one, minus 581. So you got twice 582 minus 581, that makes 583 megahertz. So if you have both of these transmitters turned on and tuned to those frequencies, you will find that there is another frequency, or another two frequencies at least, in the air. One at 580 and 180, one at 583. What I thought I'd do is have a look at um, generating those for you. So I've got one handheld here. This guy is currently on 580, so that's not going to work very well. Let's tune him to 582, shall we? Let's just um, bear with you. Talk amongst yourselves while we do... Uh, while we do this, 582 megahertz, way cool. So that's that little puppy, 582. And this guy is, um, this guy needs to be on 581. Yeah, let's do that now. Tune. Okay, now if I can have a close up on the receiver here, you'll see that the receiver is tuned to, what frequency does that say? Hopefully it says 580, yeah? So, remember, I've got one mic at 581, one mic at 582. Let's have a look and see what happens on the uh, RF meter at 580 megs as these mics get closer to each other. Wow. See, we now have a significant level of signal. Move them apart, nothing. Bring them together, and you'll see your RF level comes up. You even get some audio which is a mix of the two audio things. And it's messy and untidy and very ugly. So, um, in fact, I'm wondering whether you can even hear that. That might actually be going out on air as we speak and making me sound very, very dirty. So what I should do there is just um, wind that back. There we go. So there's an in, a, 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 a really simple explanation of intermods. Now, for two channels, if you've got two mics, it's not such a big problem for you. In fact, it's no problem for you at all if you're only running two channels because the intermodulation products are on someone else's frequencies or on other frequencies that um, you don't really care about because your receivers aren't interested in those. But if you're um, doing an OB at the footy or something and there's other journalists there or other people or if you're at uh, a festival and there's other bands coming and so on, the intermodulation products that you generate may well be interfering with someone else's mic. So it's a good idea to be thinking about your intermod products. The other thing is, on the slide, we saw how easy the maths is for two frequencies, right? But when, okay, so it's very simple arithmetic there, twice one minus the other. The nice thing is that effectively the intermod happens, look at the difference between the two, take that number, add it to one and subtract it from the other and you're underway. That's, where it that's, um, that's a simple way to do it. For two channels, maths is really easy. When you get three, four, five, six channels, maths gets a lot harder to keep track of. Um, you might even have to take your shoes off to, um, to do that calculation. So it's, um, it's really important that you take heed of the potential for intermodulation. And the two things that generate more intermodulation is as those transmitters get closer together and higher output powers. Okay, so if you've got lots of mics on stage at one time, 
if you can wind the output power down into modulation becomes much less of a problem. So there's two straightforward ways that you can um, minimise the, uh, the problems of intermodulation. Obviously reduce the power and keep the transmitters away from each other. The other two real ways are use the preset memory banks in your wireless system. Um, most of the good wireless systems, and certainly all the Sennheiser ones, have a system of preset memory banks. Those memory banks are there with a range of channels in each one. The channels in each memory bank are designed to operate together without generating intermodulation frequencies that'll get in each other's way. So the frequencies in a memory bank are designed to operate together as one set of intermodulation free frequencies. So use the memory banks. Don't switch memory banks and don't make a mix of memory banks. Use the frequencies in one memory bank. That's the simple way to, um, to avoid intermodulation. Another way to do it, and certainly for more complex jobs, um, is to use a piece of software like Sennheiser's Wireless System Manager. There's others in the market too, of course. But um, WSM, Wireless System Manager, will allow you to calculate intermodulation-free frequencies for systems of all different kinds of sizes, up to um, hundreds of channels. So use those sorts of tools to help you generate intermodulation-free channels. Really, really important. So hopefully those are some good tools to, um, to help you avoid intermod. And also hopefully that's given you an understanding of what it is that generates intermods and what they are. Bang in your questions. Let's see, uh, let's see what comes up. Um, the other thing about intermodulation is that it doesn't only happen with wireless microphones. It also happens with in-ear systems. And this is quite often a really um, significant source of intermodulation products at a gig. Very often we'll see a stack of IEM transmitters with a little forest of sticks at the back of them. Um, in fact, I was in um, uh, one of the major broadcasters recently, and I saw exactly this with their IFB transmitters. Um, a little set of IFB transmitters, four of them with a forest of sticks in the back. They had all sorts of grief trying to find some frequencies to operate their mics on. This is why. This is not a good idea because you've got those four little antennas all interfering with each other into those transmitters. It's a really good way to generate intermodulation issues. So if you do it like this on the slide with the forest of sticks, you will have bad vibes, bad karma, and the whole show is likely to be a bomb. You'll be tearing your hair out wondering what's going wrong. Please try not to do this. A much more elegant solution uses what's called an antenna combiner. So inside the antenna combiner, there are four little power amps, one for each input. This basically takes your transmitters, joins them together in a way that stops generation of intermodulation products. And you can transmit a single signal out a single antenna and it's the combination of those four IEM transmitters or IFB transmitters. It's a really nice way to get rid of the intermodulation products. A quick scan looks like this. Let's have a look. Oh, I'll show you that later. So a quick scan, he says, waiting for his computer to catch up. Oh my goodness. Hey, there it is. So when you have your little forest of six on the back, you can see on this frequency scan, there are the four major carriers. So one, two, three, four signals that you want. And then there are also these other intermodulation products that are generated because of all of those little stick antennas picking up the signals and interfering with each other. If you use an antenna combiner, your spectrum will look like this. It's clean and tidy, and now you've got some frequencies in here, some space again, that you can use. So please, do yourself a favour, as um, old Molly would say, and get yourself an antenna combiner. It's a really, really important thing to do. Um, just quickly, if you uh, need more channels than your antenna combiner has, then use more antennas, okay? Don't cascade combiners because that'll generate the potential for overload and you can run into real problems. So please, if you need to do lots and lots of IEMs, antenna combiners, multiple antennas is the way to go. So I'm going to call that a wrap there. There's, um, there's a few little um, things there that I hope have been useful for you. So your antennas, get them out into space. 
Use your boosters to only take up what you lose down the cable. And please calculate your frequencies properly. Use all the frequencies in one memory bank only. Don't use multiple memory banks. And if you uh, don't want to do it that way, you can use a software system to generate your frequencies as well. So that's uh, a little wrap. Have we got some questions, do you think? Marty, have we got some questions that um, we can take and maybe we can uh, answer a few at, uh, at this particular point in time? Questions on, questions, on, uh, questions on notice. Wow, here comes the technology. Look at this. Right, awesome. Let's have a look what this says. Okay, so some questions. So um, there seems to be, so question is from, um, from Paul, seem to be a lot of extra trials going on that ACMA haven't told us about. Well look, it's, um, ACMA's not really the communication path here, it's the telcos who are the co communication path. So it'll be uh, Telstra and Optus, if uh, it's quite possible that they're running things that, um, that you don't know about. Go to those numbers on their website and um, give them a call and they'll, uh, they will tell you, um, trust me, because um, I've given them a call about 20 times and um, they're always obliging. So don't, um, yeah, don't be frightened of giving them a call. They'll be pleased to hear from you. Um, there are lots of new phones in the market already, so um, the telcos are keen to keep those things going. Okay, um, gosh. A question about frequency finder. Um, Using Frequency Finder, what maximum distance should I allow for? Okay, so if you're using the frequencyfinder.com.au website, when you put in your, um, your location and use the location, that's, that um, website will generate a list of transmitters in the order of the expected power level at your particular location. So it takes into account the distance that you are from the transmitter and it takes into account the power level of the transmitter. So it's not so much about the distance, it's about the expected power level. So usually I try and um, have a look at the first couple, maybe two or three, and then have a look down to see if there's any that are like really close to you. They may be a flea power transmitter, but just um, examine some more sites to see if there's something that's sort of 5, 10, 20 kilometres away. It may only be 10, 10 uh, watts power or something. Just have a look in there and maybe tick that one as well. So hopefully that answers the question for you. Um, next question, when would you need to boost the antenna? Okay, um, can I go to, back to a slide? Because I have a little slide here that uh, addresses exactly that question. Thanks, George. Um, where am I here? I'll just flick along here. I'll just flick along here, we'll find this slide. Basically, the rule of thumb is if you've got more than 6 dB attenuation down your cable, yeah, no. I did have a slide here. Um, oh, I thought I had a slide here. Maybe I don't. Okay. Um, the rule of thumb is you can deal with 6 dB of attenuation, no problem, that's fine. Or you can uh, deal with um, 4 dB of overboost as well. So if you can keep sort of within, well, 4 dB, if you can keep within a 6 dB window, then, um, then that's the best option. So if you've got 6, 8, 10 dB of attenuation down your cable, add a 10 dB booster. That's probably a, a good rule of thumb. If you've got a little bit more attenuation, say 12 or 13 dB, just use that 10 dB booster as well. When you get close up to 20 dB, that's when you need to use um, a second booster. The thing I will say is, oh, well, you can use a second booster. Don't put the two boosters right next to each other because the first will overload the second. What you need to do is put the first booster near the antenna and then some way down the cable, when you've lost your 10 dB of boost, put the next booster. That will be the way to do that. Alternatively, use a lower loss cable. So hopefully that's um, a useful answer to that question. Um, 
International frequency finder sites. Somebody's asked if there are any international frequency finder sites. Um, I'm not aware of any particular international one that's available. Sennheiser UK have a very good resource of different frequency finders around the world, but um, I'm not aware of a single website that collates all those together. The um, FCC in the USA have a good one as well, but uh, I'm not aware of any single international site. Um, what about Canada? I'm sure if you um, go to Sennheiser Canada, they will have a resource that will help you find frequencies there. And I would expect, um, I'm not sure what's happening in Singapore, but again, I'll refer you back up to uh, Sennheiser in Singapore and their website. They should be able to help you there. Okay, um, Al Craig. G'day, Al. Um, could you also show the frequencies above 694 that might be usable? I'm sorry, Al, but I'm not going to encourage you to break the law. So um, right now the law says that you're not allowed to use frequencies from January 1, not allowed to use frequencies between 694 and 820. Um, have a look at the spectrum chart and see what people are doing in terms of Optus and Telstra transmitting, but um, you'll be able to see where there is no, um, no telco activity. But realistically, the law is the law. You really do need to do the right thing because one day, something will turn up in there and bite you. Um, okay, um, you went to myswitchdigitalready.com.au but didn't see the page that I showed earlier. Um, we can go there, let's have a quick look. Is your laptop safe there? Yeah. Okay, so if I go back to my switch, on the website here, let's have a quick squiz. Where is it here? Ah, here we are. My switch. So what I've done here is to, this is what the page looks like. So you have to type in a location up here. So you saw I typed in Mordialloc in Victoria, but I could type in, for example, Balgala, New South Wales. Select that one. Okay, so the website is myswitch.digitalready.gov.au. So I'm sorry, um, Al, if, um, if you went to Digital Ready, uh, myswitch.digitalready.com, it's not, it's a government site. So digitalready.gov.au should bring you to this page here. You'll see the coat of arms. Um, so if I type in the location, hopefully that'll, uh, that'll work for you. Takes a little while, it's doing a whole lot of arithmetic working out that exactly. Um, hey, Jeffrey, um, thank you very much for uh, sharing those pictures of the uh, AV rack and um, inside and out. I appreciate that. I'll buy you a beer one day. Wireless system manager. There are some national regions, but not Oz or Singapore. Um, that's true. Um, if you need the Australian file, I can uh, Give you that, just need to drop me an email. And I'll be happy to send you that file. Um, next question, keen to be able to do a recce at a location before the day with a spectrum analyzer somehow. Okay, the wireless system manager would let you take a, so you can attend site with um, one of your radio receivers because WSM uses those to do the scans. So if you go with WSM in your laptop and a receiver to do the frequency scan, you can save the, uh, save the scan as a file in WSM and use that to build your frequency plan offline later on. Remember that when you come back for the gig though, of course, other people may have turned other stuff on, so you do need to rescan to make sure of your um, make sure that it's still valid for, uh, for the day of the gig. Um, Yes, you can use RG59 in a pinch L, but remember that it won't be doing your connectors any favours at all. How are we going here? You got some more questions for me? Yeah. A couple more up here for us. Okay, um, good question. Is it legal to use a radio mic system that can transmit in the DD range if you only use it below the DD range? 
Look, it's certainly um, legal to, to own it and to operate it in the legal range. So the fact that it might actually be capable of operating in the digital dividend range um, doesn't make it illegal. The, um, what's illegal is actually to use it in that range. So as long as you operate below 694, you'll be fine and dandy. Um, do I recommend usage of wireless microphones in developing country where RF is not regulated? Well, wireless mics get used everywhere. So, um, yeah, um, and I guess realistically in areas where it's not regulated, it's um, caveat emptor. <laughs> yeah, be careful, do your homework and um, do your best not to get into trouble. Um, please comment on intermodulation caused by close proximity of phones. Okay. That, oh, that's a good question actually. The proximity of phones. So the phones can operate um, obviously down to, uh, what is it, 703 megahertz. Hopefully, um, well, in real reality, you will find that there is the potential for intermodulation to happen between a wireless mic and a phone. The, um, the laws of physics, as I said before, will function. So you need to be aware of that. Probably a good idea if you've got a wireless mic that you're using, put your phone somewhere else, keep it away, um, as I have today. That would be uh, my recommendation on that one. Can I ask a question? Okay. Yes, George? Is it the actual phone signal to the tower that's interfering, or the phone speakers and microphones that are interfering? It's the wireless signal from the phone. So the radio transmission from the phone up to the tower that will interfere with the signal from your phone, from your uh, microphone. So those two things together will generate potentially an intermodulation frequency. Yep. Cool. Okay. Um, I think we might call that a wrap. I, uh, I will say thank you very much for your attention today. Um, thanks for coming along. I hope you found it useful. And uh, I'm not sure what the facility is in terms of asking some more questions, whether we can do that at the AV Technology site, Philip, or um, whether I should invite people to send us an email at Sennheiser. Okay, so if you've got some further questions, send them to info at audiotechnology.com.au and uh, Phil will be happy to pass them on and we can answer them for you. Excellent. So I'm going to call it a wrap. Thank you very much for coming along today. Cheers.